Well, good evening. Good to have you join us this evening as we begin our Wednesday night Bible study. First song out, our hymns, of course, we sing every Wednesday night. 184 in your hymn book. I'm sure you still have those hymn books there. Jesus is all the world to me. Let's sing it together now. Jesus is all the world to me, my life, my joy, my all. He is my strength from day to day, without Him I would fall. When I am sad to Him I go, no other one can cheer me so. When I am sad, He
has to be one of my favorite hymns. I know I've talked to several of you, and it is uh, one of yours as well. Uh, well, it's good to have you this evening. It's uh, good to, to be here. Let me just make a couple of announcements real quick. Uh, I mentioned uh, Sunday that uh, Suzanne and I are going to uh, go on a vacation. Uh, well, that starts on next Tuesday. Uh, because we're doing Wednesday nights the way that we are, uh, we're just not going to have a Wednesday night Bible study uh, next week. So I want to encourage you uh, to use the time to catch up on the Bible reading that you're doing with, the, uh, uh, with our church as we're reading through the Bible in two years. Uh, I'm sure that most of you are working on that, at least I hope so, uh, but we're not going to be having our Wednesday night. I will go ahead and tell you, uh, uh, I'll tell you for sure on Sunday, I believe the prayer team is going to still meet on Tuesday, but we're getting the final word on that. The men's uh, Thursday morning Bible study will take a week off, uh, and we'll start back uh, as we, well, tomorrow we're going to be talking on the finishing up John 17. We'll skip next week, and then the following week, uh, we'll get into John 18. Uh, so that's next week. Uh, let me just tell you, Father's Day is not a Sunday you want to miss. Um, uh, Reverend Michael Clayton uh, is going to be speaking, and uh, you won't want to miss him. I wish I could be here. Well, I'll be, I'll be worshiping uh, with the live stream and while we're in Tennessee, uh, but uh, uh, you won't want to miss him. He's a wonderful speaker. He has spoken in uh, churches all over the country, as well as other seminars that he's, he's put on. So he's a well-known speaker. You won't want to miss him. So I encourage you on Father's Day, that would be not this Sunday, but the following Sunday. Uh, that's a hint to all you uh, that need to honor your fathers. Um, that, uh, that is not a Sunday you want to miss. Uh, so, but I'm excited about tonight. You know, uh, before, back before the COVID quarantine began, and we started recording our, our uh, Wednesday nights, we did about a four or five week study on prayer. Uh, and, you know, we finished Tabernacle, had a little bit more to say last week, and as I was thinking about, well, I don't want to start some, another series when we're going to be taking next week off, so I thought, what, what could we talk about? And, and it dawned on me there's an area of prayer that we did not cover uh, that we should have, and so we're going to take care of that uh, this evening. We, in our series, we talked about the importance of of uh, building into your prayers, including a time of praise and adoration. We talked about that quite a bit, that it's, there, there's a difference between vertical prayer and horizontal prayer. Vertical prayer is when we are communing with our Father on a, on a personal, one-on-one -on -one basis. A lot of people miss that part of prayer, and that's the most, uh, that's the, the best part of prayer, as we can individually uh, spend time and commune with our Heavenly Father. Uh, now I know it's not like having a conversation with somebody because you can see their eyes, you can see their face, you can uh, hear their voice audibly, but the more we spend time with the Father, the more we can uh, sense what He says to us. And, and uh, we have His Word, and He brings His Word to mind as we pray. And that is a special time of just just praising and adoring Him as our God and Father. Uh, on the other side, though, we have the horizontal prayer. Now, so often people think of prayer as just praying for each other. Well, that is important. That's the horizontal prayer. It's intercessory prayer. We need to pray for each other. The Bible talks about the uh, importance of, of uh, praying for one another. Uh, and as we finished up talking about uh, prayer, we finished talking about those times when God doesn't respond like we wish. What happens when God says no? What happens when things, the way things play out is exactly the opposite of what we asked? Those are times when we simply need to bow the knee and recognize that He is God and we are not. It's at those times that we have to admit that his master plan is far more trustworthy than the plan that we see. Well, as I was thinking about this evening, 
it dawned on me that there's one other aspect of prayer. There's probably many, but there's one specifically that uh, we need to, to add to our, our understanding of prayer. There are certainly times when heaven is silent simply because God had a better plan. But we must not miss the biblical teaching that there are also times when heaven is silent because we have personally hindered our prayers. We have personally done damage to our relationship with our Father, causing Him to, well, ignore our communication with Him. That is possible. I believe it happens all the time. And it's important that we understand what hinders prayer. Uh, back in 2008, a child psychologist named Dr. Kevin Lehman, he's got a lot of studies out and uh, a lot of the LifeWay studies were written by him, but in 2008 he put out a book called Have a New Kid by Friday. And uh, in this book he, he gave parents a method of rethinking how to discipline kids. Well, in it, he explained the effectiveness of what he calls, or what's called, reality discipline. Helping your child connect actions with consequences. Helping them see consequences to their actions. Simply because real consequences, let's face it, are the only way that many of us learn. Well, there's a reason for that. God created us to be sensory beings. He, he created us that way. So when we get positive feedback for a given, act, uh, a given action, our brains file that action away as a good thing. When we get negative feedback from a particular action, our minds file that away as, well, maybe that wasn't a good idea. So when we get positive feedback from a negative action, it, it encourages bad behavior. That's pretty simple. Uh, most of us who have been parents have seen that in action. But if for some reason a child decides that it's a good idea, you know, for example, say your child think, or grandchild think it's a good idea to pet a scorpion. Odds are they're never going to do that again, right? That got negative feedback for a given action. That's just how we're wired. Well, since God created us to respond to consequences, why would we think that when we're adopted as God's child, he wouldn't parent us with something like reality discipline. Why would I think that my actions would have absolutely no effect on my prayer life? Well, of course my actions have an effect on my prayer life. There are several aspects of our lives that the Bible says actually hinder my prayers. And I believe that it will be, be wise for us to spend a little bit of time thinking through this as we try ourselves to become more effective prayers. We want to have a, an effective prayer life. I, I believe that you are with me in, in recognizing that maybe our prayer life could be better than it is right now. Maybe we could continue to grow in our prayer life. Well, we need to learn what hinders it. In his book, Pray Like It Matters, uh, Dr. Steve Gaines, uh, he's pastor of Bellevue Baptist Church. So the, uh, he's the successor to the great Adrian Rogers. And he was also president of the Southern Baptist Convention. He wrote this little book, uh, real easy read, called Pray Like It Matters. And in this book, he listed eight hindrances to prayer uh, that he has found in his study of Scripture. Some are implied in Scripture. Others are specifically mentioned. So this evening, what I want to do is I want to step through these with the motive that we all search ourselves and see if any of these things might be hindering our prayer right now. See if there's anything about our lives that might cause our prayer life to be ineffective. My prayer for this evening is that we all can take a giant step forward this evening just by considering these eight things. So let's get started. 
The first hindrance, I'm going to get right to the juggler, right up front. Busyness. Busyness. We are a busy people. Even at retirement, we seem to find things to fill up our day that end up crowding out our time with the Lord. It has been said, if the devil cannot make you bad, he will try to make you busy. Busyness. Dr. Gaines said in his book, busyness is one of the great enemies of effective prayer. I want you to turn to one of my mom's least favorite passages in all the Bible, Luke chapter 10. My mom was a, a servant heart. She was a hostess by, by uh, personality, and she never liked reading this passage, and you'll see why in a minute. It's, it's a very familiar passage about Jesus in the home of Mary and Martha. Um, this is the account where uh, Jesus was teaching, Mary was at his feet, and Martha was trying to get dinner ready. Remember? So let's look at it. Luke chapter 10, and let's begin reading in verse 38. Luke reported, Now as they were traveling along, he entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister called Mary, who was seated at the Lord's feet, listening to his word. But Martha was distracted with all her preparations. And she came up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the serving alone? Then tell her to help me. But the Lord answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and bothered about so many things. But only one thing is necessary, for Mary has chosen the good part, which shall not be taken away from her. To which all hostesses say, now wait just a minute. How are they going to eat if Martha didn't prepare the meal? That's not fair. Somebody had to prepare the meal, right? We, you know, wasn't Mary the lazy one? If the day had been left up to Mary, they would have all starved, right? But let me ask you this. Why was a complete meal so absolutely necessary at that moment? Think about it. Martha had God in the house, and he was teaching. It was her own self-induced pressure that made being a hostess priority over spending time with Jesus. Because of her own expectations of herself and what she perceived that others expected of her, she removed herself from Jesus' presence to perform a function that Jesus hadn't actually asked her to do. So, does that mean that we can neglect our family with the excuse, sorry, I didn't get dinner done because I was praying? That's not what I'm saying. We have legitimate responsibilities and expectations that are ours to fulfill. But when placed directly against time with the Lord, we must prioritize appropriately. There are some things that are simply just important to us, but not important in the big scheme of things. In Martha's mind, Having Jesus and his disciples in her home without giving them, putting on the dog, so to speak, and giving them the best meal ever was so important in her own mind that she missed an opportunity having God in her home. That's what Jesus was saying. How often are the hours of the day filled with self-defined responsibilities and expectations that result in us being too busy to pray. When the reality is that our time with the Lord is far more important than most of our busyness. If we don't schedule a time with the Lord, let's just face it, He will be crowded out. 
And the over-the-shoulder toss-up prayers that we pray during the day just might go totally ignored because our prayers are hindered by busyness. And if we go long enough, God has been known to lay us flat on our backs so we have nothing to do but pray, if you know what I mean. Don't let busyness hinder your prayer life. Second one is the other side of the coin, laziness. This is when we busy ourselves with leisure, which can be even worse. Dr. Gaines defines this as when we use our time poorly, failing to understand that to waste time is to waste life. Now, don't hear me wrong. There's nothing wrong with leisure. That's why God gave his people the Sabbath, so that they would have one day a week for rest. Many of us could take note of that fact. But when leisure becomes an excuse to ignore God, you are in danger of having your prayers hindered. You don't have to turn here right now, but let me just read 1 Timothy chapter 4, you might jot that down. 1 Timothy chapter 4, beginning at the end of verse 7, Paul told his young protege, Timothy, and I quote, Discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. For bodily discipline is only of little profit, but godliness is profitable for all things, since it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. End of quote. Don't let leisure crowd out our prayer time because you might find yourself in danger of hindering your prayer life the third unforgiveness unforgiveness right after Jesus taught his disciples the model prayer he said something that we mustn't pass over too quickly flip over to Matthew chapter 6 now we've looked at this model prayer before and and I mentioned this to you then, but it needs to be repeated. In Matthew chapter 6, uh, people so often quote the Lord's Prayer all the time without a thought to what they're saying. In fact, I know you're at home, but, but say it out loud with me. Let's just say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now, most of us can just rattle that off. We've learned it all of our lives, especially if you grew up in a different, uh, a different denomination that, that recited it every Sunday. We know the model prayer. How easy it is to simply rattle it off without a thought of the conditional statement that we just made. By praying that prayer, to what did we tie God's forgiveness of our trespasses? Think back through the prayer. What did we tie God's forgiveness of us to? Well, Jesus made sure that we didn't miss it because after he said that prayer, he came back to that point. Now look at Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 14. He said, For if you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Look at verse 15. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. Our unforgiveness can actually put a wedge between our relationship to the Father, thereby hindering our prayers. When I for refuse to forgive someone, regardless of what they've done, that hinders my relationship with the one who forgave me. And he forgave me a lot. The reality is, how can I accept forgiveness from him if I'm unwilling to forgive you? When I'm unwilling to forgive someone that wronged me. When we refuse to grant forgiveness, the result is bitterness. And I like what, uh, what Dr. Gaines mentioned in this particular section. He said, it's been said, and I quote, Bitterness is an acid 
that destroys its own container. Think about that. Bitterness is an acid that destroys its own container. When we refuse to forgive, I don't, I'm, there, there's not a level of, of offense that is beyond this command, okay? Everything. When we're not willing to forgive, then we are hindering our relationship to our Father who forgave us so much. And we're in danger of having our prayers hindered. Now, the next two I'm putting together. Dr. Gaines saw them uh, as, as uh, no difference, but I, I mean, uh, he saw them as, as uh, different things, but I see no difference in them. Uh, disobedience and unconfessed sin. What is unconfessed sin if it's not unconfessed disobedience, right? Now, we need to be careful here with the idea that all of our blessings are merit-based. That if I've been good, I can come to God with the expectation that He will automatically reward me with whatever I ask because I've been good. And if I've not been good, then my life will show obvious signs of cursing. Well, that's not how life works. In fact, Jesus was asked about a blind man, remember? His disciples, or somebody in the crowd, said, why is this man blind? Was it his sin or his parents? Remember what Jesus said? Neither. He's blind so that the glory of God can be exalted. That's my paraphrase. But the Bible is very clear that disobedience pulls us out from under the blessing of the Father. Just like when a child goes outside the boundary set by their parents, they potentially place themselves in danger, right? Well, flip over to the Old Testament, to Isaiah 59. Yes, our relationship to the Father is different this side of the cross, I get that. But I believe the sentiment of this is the same. Isaiah 59. Just the first two verses. The prophet said, Behold, the Lord's hand is not so short that it cannot save, nor is his ear so dull that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. Our disobedience, our unconfessed sin, it's not that God leaves us, it's that we leave Him. It places a wedge in our relationship. It keeps our prayers from being effective. The psalmist was equally clear in Psalm 66 when he wrote, If I regard wickedness in my heart, the Lord will not hear. Unconfessed sin drives that wedge. It's important that we ask the Lord to help us see our sin. And that when He shows it to us, that we not only confess it as sin, but we ask His help to repent from that sin. That should be a daily part of our prayer life, to take an honest look at our actions, thoughts, and attitudes, and ask God to reveal to us any disobedience that is in us. Remember what David prayed? Search me, O oh God, and see if there's any unrighteousness, any, any ugliness, any sin in me. When we are disobedient to our Father, we place ourselves in danger of having our prayers hindered. Another thing that hinders prayer is kind of a subset of that. It's kind of a major amplification of that, and that's idolatry. That's an especially devastating form of disobedience that carries the danger of placing a wedge between us and our Father. I thought Dr. Gaines said it very well. And I quote, We are guilty of idolatry any time something or someone becomes more significant to us and more influential in our life than God Himself. I believe it was Tony Evans that I heard put it this way. And I quote, well, I, this, is a, this is my paraphrase from my memory, but this is basically what he said. Think of the thing in your life that if it was taken from you would cause you to turn your back on God. 
that would be your idol. Anything that we place on a higher level in our life than God is, that's idolatry. In our Bible reading this week, Ezekiel records some pretty lewd details about what Israel's and Judah's uh, response, their idolatry was in the eyes of God. God compared idolatry to adultery, which is the closest that we can come in our experience of approaching what it does to God when we cheat on him, which is basically what idolatry is. It's cheating on God. When we prove by our actions that something or someone is more important than God is. God shares the throne with no one. And if I in my life place something in my life is more important than he is, something that I feel is more important than worshiping him, it's more important than spending time with him, I'm in grave danger of having my prayers hindered. John wrote in 1 John chapter 5, little children, guard yourselves from idols. Now that was long after. John wrote that probably, I don't know, 60 years after Jesus ascended. And idolatry was still an issue. Idolatry is not just setting up some carved figure in our house and lighting candles around it. Idolatry is anything in our life that we deem more important than God. When we place something in our lives as being higher than God, we place ourselves in danger of having our prayers hindered. Two more. Next one, marriage strife. Turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 3. Now, throughout the Bible, God's relationship to his people is compared to the relationship between a husband and wife. And whether we like it or not, the husband holds the position of God in that analogy. Now, men, before you start getting high on your hog about that part of the analogy, because of that analogy, we are held to a higher standard. And I want to make sure that we understand something that Peter said. So let's just, let's just read it. 1 Peter chapter 3. I just want to read verse 7. Peter tells us, husbands, you husbands in the same way, live with your wives in an understanding way, as with someone weaker, since she is a woman, and show her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life, so that your prayers will not be hindered. Okay, this is probably not the preferred verse for a man to read at a women's conference without any explanation. But think about what he's saying, okay? When I've preached this message, which I did a few years ago here, I like to place a, a, a drinking glass on the pulpit. And then right next to it, place a crystal goblet. And then I ask the question, given these two, which would you more likely hand to a five-year-old with juice in it? Well, of course, nobody would hand a crystal goblet to a five-year-old. They'd always hand the regular glass, right? There's just something about a crystal goblet that makes us automatically treat it more gently. I want you to notice Peter did not say women are weaker. He did not say that in this verse. He said, as with someone weaker. As if she were weaker. It's talking about gentleness. Not whether a woman is strong or weak. It's talking about gentleness. God fully intended men to treat their wives like someone would treat a crystal goblet. With gentleness, love, and respect. But he went a step further and in included consequences if we don't. So men, this one's just for us. If you treat your wife without honor, if you disrespect your wife, we place ourselves in danger of having our prayers hindered. Finally, the last one. Please turn with me to the book of James. 
just over one book, James chapter 1. Lack of faith. Prayer and faith go together. The question that we need to ask ourselves is this. Do I really think prayer matters? Now, I have to have this conversation with myself sometimes, because even though I'm not Calvinist, sometimes my prayers come across as if they're Calvinist. That, you know, God's going to do what he's going to do. It's already predestined. It's already going to happen. It really doesn't matter whether I pray or not. God's going to, God has his plan, and my prayers is just my opportunity to join in what he's doing. But it really doesn't have any effect. Is that true? Well, let me just say as clearly as I can, that is not true. God is certainly sovereign. There's no question. But God has chosen, understand this, God has chosen to operate in coordination with the prayers of his people. There are things in God's plan that were delayed because of lack of prayer. Now, did God's will happen? Sure, eventually. But the people that it was intended to happen through missed out because of lack of faith, lack of prayer. A perfect example is the children of Israel, right? They, they came out of Egypt. They, they hung out at, the, at Sinai for a while so that God could give them a law, give them a tabernacle, teach them how they were supposed to worship and what they were supposed to do. And then they were supposed to go right into the promised land. That was the plan. They got to the edge. Their lack of faith said, that's it. You're done. Your children are going to go in. Now, God's plan of getting them in the promised land still happened. And his plan of having them be an eternal kingdom with him on the throne is still going to happen. But because of disobedience and because of a lack of faith, that's been delayed beyond 2020. I can tell you without any doubt that it has been delayed beyond 2027. I know that because the beginning of the tribulation could start today and then it's seven years. Okay, so it's at least been delayed until 2027 because of disobedience. So the lack of faith can change God's timing. On the flip side, the prayer of faith can change God's timing. Think of King Hezekiah. God sent the prophet to King Hezekiah and said, you need to put your things in order because you're about to die. King Hezekiah humbled himself, and he prayed in faith. And God said, before the, before the prophet even got off of his property, he said, okay, go back in, tell him I'm going to give him a few more years. Now, he died. God's will happened, but his prayers changed the timing. Every one of us, if we're not in the rapture, we're going to die. Okay? Our prayers can affect the timing. So prayer of the prayer of faith for healing, that's effective. Okay, just look at uh, James chapter 1, beginning in verse 5. It says, But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But he must ask in faith without doubting. For the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For that man ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord, being a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Our faith in our Lord makes our prayers effective. Our lack of faith in our Lord hinders our prayers. Now, when I pray... When I pray for you, for example, if you are sick, and I ask the Lord to heal. Now, I don't know what God's plan is for you, but I have 
faith, I absolutely trust that God can heal you and that he will heal you eventually, but I'm praying that he'll heal you now. But I bow to the fact that God may have a plan that I don't understand. Now, that's, that's how I understand the prayer of faith. But we must believe that God hears us. We, we must believe that God will act on our prayers. Otherwise, it can hinder our prayer life. And so now that we know what hinders our prayer, let's pray, shall we? I'm going to ask if Susan can make her way to the piano in just a moment. But uh, we have several things to, to pray for. And I have been very uh, cautious since we're posting this on YouTube of mentioning names and, and uh, conditions. And I, I continue to feel that way. So, uh, but... But Betty sent out a, a prayer list earlier, and it has on there uh, different things that need to be prayed over. I know that we still have uh, a, a couple of people in our church, or one person in our church, and then uh, their family, that is still uh, fighting COVID. Uh, praise the Lord, he healed the first family that, that got it. Uh, praise the Lord also that this, this one that has the COVID uh, is pretty much asymptomatic and actually back at work according to the doctor's orders. So they're changing uh, all the protocol right, right now. But, uh, but praise the Lord for that, but just continue praying for him. Uh, we, have, uh, we have one that I know of, one that's in the hospital right now that we need to be in prayer. Uh, and just generally, you, you know from the prayer list, those within our church membership that need prayer. There's also uh, some extended family and, and uh, friends of our members that need prayer. So I want to ask you to, to, if you haven't printed that out, at least pull it up on your phone or your tablet or your computer. And uh, we're going to have a time of silent prayer. And it's during that time that I want to ask you to just lift some of these up. And, and I'll give a few minutes uh, and then, or a few moments, and then I'll close in prayer. And uh, if you're still praying when I start, just pause and let me close us in prayer. And then after we close, then you can finish praying. Because it's important that we exercise what we talk about and pray. So let's just bow our heads right now and just spend a moment with God, shall we? will be able to think through these hindrances. Lord, teach us to pray. That's what your disciples asked. Every one of us can improve in the area of prayer. And Lord, I just ask you to help us to see these hindrances in our life if they're there. And Lord, I ask you to help us to repent. Lord, forgive us for the busyness and help each one of us to make spending time with you an absolute priority. Lord, we love you. We thank you for your grace, for your mercy. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, it's good to have you this evening. 
And I uh, hope that you have a great week and see you Sunday.